All right, so in section 3.3, we're going to start looking at the derivative of trig functions. So first off, we have to start with these two big facts. And these facts are still going to be used at the end of the section um, to do some more investigation of limits. But these two facts are that the limit of sine of x over x as x approaches 0 equals 1, and the limit of cosine of x minus 1 over x as x approaches 0 is 0. All right, we also have to recall from trig a couple of addition identities. So remember that sine of a plus b is sine a cosine b plus cosine a sine b, and cosine a plus b equals cosine a cosine b sine a sine b. So first we're going to investigate the derivative of sine. All right, so we're going to have the limit as h approaches 0 of sine of x plus h minus sine of x divided by h. Okay, so that's the definition using the limit of the derivative of sine. Now let's see if we can simplify it and actually get something um, that we can recognize. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this identity here so that I can rewrite that as sine of x cosine of h plus cosine of x sine of h all over h and then don't forget we also have that minus sine of x back here. Alright, now one thing that I notice when I'm looking at this is that this and this term have a sine of x in common. So what I can do is I can rewrite that as the limit as h approaches 0 of sine of x times cosine of h minus 1 over h plus, and then I'm going to add this piece here, cosine of x sine of h all over h. Now, here is where these two limits come in handy. First off, notice that this piece is going to go to 0 as h goes to 0, and notice that this piece is going to go to 1 as h goes to 0. So what we are going to be left with will be a sine of x times 0 plus cosine of x times 1, which means the derivative of sine is going to be cosine. Now, here is another way that we could have deduced that. If we graph sine, remember it looks like this guy, now what I want to do is I want to graph its tangent line. So if I look here and here and here at the peaks and valleys, I know I'm going to have a slope of 0. So that means that my derivative is going to hit the x-axis at those three points. Now the other thing I noticed is if I look at the slope right at that peak in between the curves, I'm going to have a slope of 1 here, and at this opposite peak, I'm going to have a slope of negative 1. So if I continue that pattern, I see that the derivative is going to give me the graph of cosine. So, just to wrap it up, if you take sine of x and you take its derivative, it's going to be cosine of x. Now, let's use the same idea to find the derivative of cosine. <clears throat> so, we're going to take the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine of x plus h minus cosine of x, all divided by h. Now again, we're going to use that identity formula to rewrite this. So that is going to be the limit as h approaches 0 of, so cosine of x plus h, we can rewrite that as cosine x times cosine h minus, whoops, sine x 
sine h minus cosine x all over h. So remember, I use that trig um, addition identity to rewrite this. Now, just like before, notice that this and this term both have a cosine in common. So what I can do is I can factor that out. So it will give me the limit as h approaches 0 of, so that would be cosine of x times cosine of h minus 1 all over h minus sine x sine h all over h. Now again, just like last time, I know that this piece is going to go to 0 as h approaches 0 by that limit uh, above. And I know that sine of h over h is going to go to 1. So what I'm going to be left with is, and this is important, don't forget that negative. That means this whole thing is going to go to negative sine of x. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Now, those are the only two derivatives for trig that you really need to know because all other trig functions are based on sine and cosine. So for example, if we want to find the derivative of tangent, we're not going to use the limit definition. But what we are going to do is we are going to explore this by using trig identities. So let's say we want to explore the derivative of tangent. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a trig identity that tells me that tangent is the same thing as sine over cosine. Now, I know the derivative of sine because it's cosine. I just did that. <clears throat> the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And because I'm dividing them from the last section, I can use the quotient rule. So the quotient rule is going to be the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. All right, it looks pretty nasty, but I think we can make it look better. So cosine times cosine is going to give us cosine squared. Negative sine times negative sine is going to give us positive sine squared. All over, again, cosine of x squared. Now, one of the best trig identities in the whole wide world is cosine squared plus sine squared equals what? It equals 1! Yay! So, we're going to have cosine squared x on the bottom, which, remember, 1 over cosine, what's that identity? That is the same thing as secant. So, the derivative of tangent is secant squared. Now I give you guys a little summary of all of the trig identities. You can prove them, or all the um, derivative of trig functions, you can prove them yourself. Um, it's probably going to be a couple of your homework assignments. Might even show up on an exam sometime. So let's use what we learned to find the derivative of the following functions. So let's say that we want to find the derivative of y equals x squared sine x. So because these two are multiplying together, we're going to have to use a product rule. So we're going to take the derivative of the first piece, leave the second piece alone, plus, now we're going to leave the first piece alone, times the derivative of the second piece. Remember, the derivative of cos or sine is cosine. And that's that. Now let's look at the next one. So we want to find the derivative of cotangent divided by cosine, or yes, divided by cosine. Now, whenever I'm doing these kind of problems, what I like to do at first is I like to see if I can simplify it at all using trig identities. So cotangent is the same as cosine over sine. Now, dividing by cosine is the same as multiplying by 1 over cosine. Now, here's something interesting. I have a cosine on the top and a cosine on the bottom, so those are going to cancel. So I'll be left with 1 over sine, which is the same thing as cosecant of x. So finding f prime of x will be the same as finding the derivative of cosecant, which 
if I scroll up here, the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant x. So just a hint to you guys, um, when you're trying to find the derivative <clears throat> of trig functions and you're multiplying them or dividing them, try rewriting them first and it'll save you some time. Ooh, here's a good one. Now we want to prove that the derivative of secant is secant x times tan x. So what we want to do is start with that left-hand side and try to get it to look like this right-hand side. So first off, I know that secant is the same thing as 1 over cosine of x. So what I'm going to do is I am going to use my quotient rule to find the derivative of this guy. So that's going to be the bottom times the derivative of the top. Now what's the derivative of 1? Well, since it's a constant, it's going to be 0. Minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is negative sine of x, all over the bottom squared, so all over cosine squared x. So cosine x times 0 is going to give us 0. Negative 1 times negative sine of x will give us a positive sine x and we're dividing by cosine squared x. Now, I'm going to rewrite this as cosine x cosine x. Now, here's why. I can kind of imagine the sine and x being multiplied by a 1. So, what I have is this piece here is going to be my tangent, and this piece here is secant. So, that tells me that I can rewrite this as secant x tan x. Check. So I totally nailed it. Good job. All right, the next one asks, for what values does f of x equal x plus sine of x have a horizontal tangent line? So remember, a horizontal tangent line means that we're looking for peaks and valleys where a tangent line is straight like this. So first off, let's find the derivative. So the derivative of x is 1. The derivative of sine is cosine. Now, if I'm looking at where we have a horizontal tangent line, a horizontal line has a slope of what? It has a slope equal to 0. So what I need to do is I need to set this equal to 0 and then solve. So 0 equals 1 plus cosine x. So I'll have negative 1 equals cosine of x. Now if I take cosine inverse of both sides, I'm going to have cosine inverse of negative 1 will equal my x value, which is going to equal pi. Okay. Another way you could have done that if you don't like dealing with inverses is if you look at the unit circle, remember cosine is your x-coordinate, so here are coordinates 1, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1. And remember, this is at 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and then this is 2 pi. So this is saying, hey, at what angle does cosine equal negative 1? That's going to be at pi. Now remember, we can go around and around and around the unit circle as many times as we want. So the actual answer that you'll probably want to input is it's going to be any pi value plus 2 pi n. Okay? Or another way that you could write that is you could write that as pi times 2n plus 1. Either way is fine, but we want to make sure that we get all the solutions in there. All right. <clears throat> now, this one is directly from the homework, but I thought it was a pretty good one. So what we have is that we have a mass on a spring vibrates horizontally on a smooth level surface. Its equation of motion is x of t equals 8 sine of t, where t is in seconds and x is in centimeters. The first thing it wants us to do is it wants us to find the velocity and acceleration at time t. So first off, what we have is a spring, and in the middle we're calling that like it's homeostasis, right? 
And what the spring does is it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Okay. So if we want to find the velocity and this is the position, then the velocity is going to be its first derivative. So the first derivative of 8 sine of t, remember the 8 is going to stay in front, and then the derivative of sine is cosine. Acceleration is the second derivative, so if we take the derivative of 8 cosine of t, we're going to get negative 8 sine of t. The reason that negative is there is because, remember, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Good, so 1 is done. Part B says find the position, velocity, and the acceleration of the mass at time t equals 2 pi over 3. So if we want to find the position, velocity, and acceleration at t equals 2 pi over 3, what we're going to do is take these three equations and plug in 2 pi over 3 for our t values. Once we do that, for a position we're going to get 4 times the square root of 3. For velocity, we're going to get negative 4. <clears throat> and then for acceleration, we're going to get negative 4 square root 3. So what do all of these mean? Well, let's do these in different colors. So we have this weight on a spring. Moose. Okay, so we have this weight on a spring. And the position of the weight is 4 times root 3. So what that means is that it is going to be to the right of 0. So its position is going to be 4 times root 3. All right, great. So we have its position. Its position is right here. The next thing is what about its velocity? So its velocity is negative 4. Now, if velocity is negative, what that means is that that means that the distance between our starting point and our object is getting smaller. So if our object is positioned here and our velocity is negative, is it going to the right or is it going back to the left? It's actually going to be going back to the left because this distance between our starting point and our object is getting smaller. All right, last but not least, is what does negative 4 root 3 mean? Well, if you let a spring go and you have a weight, what it's going to do is it's going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But it's not going to continue to go back and forth forever. What's going to happen is it's going to start to slow down. So a negative acceleration means it's actually decelerating. It's slowing down. All right, awesome. So what we're going to do next is that we're going to evaluate the following limits. We're going to do that in the next video, and we're going to use the information that we got from the very top of this section.